Well, here we are, the final video of the 2018-19 academic year, and a lot of you have been in touch recently to say that you've got exams coming up in the next week or so, so I just want to take this opportunity to wish everyone watching this all the very best of luck in your exams, and uh, I know you'll ace them, so don't worry about it. Anyway, this video is going to be on constructive trust. It was requested by Teresa, so this one goes out to you, and the best place to start with constructive trust is to try and get a definition down. So we'll start with that. And I think the reason for that is because constructive trust can come up in a lot of different circumstances. So while you may have a question that specifically deals with constructive trust, being able to spot them is really important. And I think the top thing to look out for is that unconscionability. So let's start with that. I think the best way to start off with constructive trust is to give you an example, and we use quite an extreme example. So on the left here we have Dr. Crippen, and he murdered his wife Cora Turner by poisoning her. Now Cora Turner was quite famous back in the day, this was the early 20th century, she had quite a significant fortune, but because she died in test state, meaning she didn't have a will, the money would have gone to Dr. Crippen. Now obviously this is a bit of a repugnant result that a man can murder his wife and then profit from it. And so we can use a constructive trust to say that because of the unconscionable behaviour of Dr. Crippen, he is actually holding this money on trust. And so that's where the constructive trust comes from. Now to get more of a formal definition, we can go to Lord Justice Millet in Paragon Finance. And he says that constructive trusts arise whenever the circumstances are such that it would be unconscionable for the owner of property to assert his own beneficial interest and deny the beneficial interest of another. And we can see that in the first example that we gave, Dr. Crippen is obviously benefiting from his unconscionable behaviour, and so we use constructive trust to essentially step in. Now we need to go a little bit further and sort of talk about when constructive trust will arise, and this is where there is a fiduciary relationship. Now, often when we're talking about this throughout this lecture, we're going to be thinking about trustees and beneficiaries. But it is important to be aware that it is not limited to that. It can also cover solicitors and their clients, or company directors with respect to their companies as well. So this unconscionable behaviour, it's really important that we also get a definition of this. And basically the fiduciary is not allowed to make a profit or have a conflict of interest. And that comes from the very old case of Bray and Ford from 1896, Lord Herschel giving us the definition in that case. Now, there is a bit of a debate about whether those two are really sort of the same thing. Uh, if a person is making a profit, then obviously that relates to the conflict of interest. And we'll see that they are closely intertwined in the context of the different cases. And we'll start off by thinking about Boardman and Phipps in 1967, and how we, the courts can look at the circumstances of the case to decide if there is a conflict of interest and whether the person is making a profit as well. So the typical um, circumstance in which a constructive trust will arise in, the, in trust law is where we have a trustee at the top of our screen and the beneficiaries at the bottom of the screen. And so there is that fiduciary relationship there of trustee and beneficiary. Now, constructive trusts often come about because of unconscionable behaviour, and we've seen that that relates to making a profit in the first instance, and also the creation of a um, conflict of interest. So in this particular example of Boardman and Phipps that we're thinking about, the situation was that the trust was involved in, the com in a company, but the company wasn't doing very well. And so what the trustees decided to do was that they would take over the company and in fact, they did a really good job when they did so. So the company started making a lot of money. And in theory, this was very good for all of the parties concerned. On the one hand, the trustees get to make a lot of money and because they have turned this company around and it's now doing really well. Meanwhile, the beneficiaries also get to benefit as well because obviously the trust is involved in the company. And so if the company is doing well, that also means the trust is doing well and the beneficiaries get their um, due course of that. Now the problem is that because we have this trustee who is making a profit from this, the only reason that he's been able to make a profit is because he has been involved in the trust instrument himself, otherwise he might not have known about the company's existence, might not have known that he would, he would be able to turn it around 
and therefore make a big profit. So he's essentially used his position as a trustee to get inside information and therefore make a profit himself. So although he's done really well to turn the company around and now make a profit, he is also going to have to pay that profit back to the trust because that's, um, that's the only fair thing to do. And so those profits are held on constructive trust for the beneficiaries. On the other hand, we had that case of Queen, Queensland Mine, which is an Australian case, but is also quite instructive. So in that particular example, we sort of had a similar type of situation where a company was not able to develop uh, its mines. And so the director went ahead and developed the mines instead. And he made a profit while doing this. But in that particular situation, the court said that because the director of the company had actually informed uh, the company what he was going to do, so they knew that he was going to go out and try and make the profit, and also the fact that the company didn't have the resources, resources itself to actually develop the mines meant that they didn't really lose out on the opportunity themselves, and so a constructive trust did not arise in that situation. And so the point here is that you need to really look at the circumstances of the case as a whole and consider the actions of the trustee and whether they really fall within that definition of unconscionable. In other words, has the trustee acted in respect of a conflict of interest and are they making a profit? And so hopefully that gives you a sign of how those two things do intertwine quite a lot. So this status of unauthorised profits or bribes is possibly something that might come up as part of an essay question. It has changed quite a lot over the years. I've listed some of the key cases there. Lister and Stubbs from 1890 originally said that there wouldn't be a constructive trust. That was reversed to an extent in Attorney General of Hong Kong and Reed in 1994. And then it was looked at again in 2011 in the Sinclair Investments case. But if you are just answering this as part of a problem question, and you just need to know what the law is as it stands today, then in the case of FHR European Ventures from 2014, it was decided that these profits or bribes, um, whatever it might be, the unconscionable conduct where a trustee or someone in a fiduciary relationship is making a profit, um, then that is going to be held on a constructive trust. One of the other areas in which the constructive trust can come up is where statute is used as an instrument of fraud. And this is, comes from the classic case of Rochefoucauld and Boustead from 1897, which we'll look at in a minute. However, it's important to say that when someone does have a statu statutory right, it's not really for the courts to intervene in that and get in the way of their legal rights. So in Midland Bank Trust Company Limited and Green, the type of situation that we're talking about, is where a father was going to give his son first option on land. And in theory, that should have been registered under the Land Charges Act, um, but they simply failed to do so. Then, when the father and son fell out, and the father um, decided to deliberately sell the land at a cheaper price to his wife um, to exclude his son, the son actually brought a case and said that he shouldn't be allowed to do that because he's essentially using the statute, i.e. the fact that it should have been registered under the Land Charges Act, as an instrument of fraud. But the courts were quite keen to point out that the father does own the land, and therefore he does have the right to sell it. And so even though the son loses out because of the requirements of the statute, that does, shouldn't be allowed to interfere with the actual rights itself. So what is an example then of where a statute is used as an instrument of fraud? Well, let's look at this example of Rochefoucauld and Boustead. And so we have at the bottom here someone who um, owns a house, but they're struggling with the mortgage repayments. And so we have someone who comes along and offers to help. And they say, well, I will buy the property from you and then well, I will hold it on trust for you so that you still have the beneficial interest. And um, meanwhile, I will take that. And the problem was in Rochefoucauld and Boustead was that this wasn't actually written down. And so at a later point, the person who had bought the property asserted their rights as the buyer. And so we have this situation where the person is not now not only losing out in terms of their mortgage repayments, but they actually don't have the legal interest in the house anymore. And they've lost out on the beneficial interest as well. So how do we resolve this situation? Well, fortunately, the courts can step in and impose a constructive trust in this situation. 
using the statute, i.e. the requirement that it should be in writing, um, this deal um, between the two people, um, using that as an instrument of fraud um, is obviously not allowed. And so the courts are allowed to step in and say that there is a constructive trust here and that the house is being held for the benefit of the person who originally sold it in the first place. So property is quite a common area where constructive trusts do arise um, and in particular in any sort of sale of property once the contract is signed the seller then holds the property on constructive interest for the buyer until there is actually completion. And that comes from the case of Chin and Collins from 1981. Joint ventures can also give rise to a constructive trust. This is where two companies might go into business together to develop a certain piece of land if they decide to do so, then we'll see in the situation, it works very much like what we will call a common intention constructive trust. And so if one goes behind the other's back and tries to assert their legal interest in the land, then kind of like what we saw with the previous case of Rochefort Co and Bustead, the courts are going to step in and say that because these two were partners, um, that one, the person who has the legal interest in the land shouldn't simply be allowed to assert it and exclude the other one because to do so would be unconscionable. Meanwhile, uh, I've mentioned re rose here as well. This is something that more or less comes up in land law more than it does in equity. Nevertheless, it's quite a useful example of constructive trusts and it's worthwhile being aware of it. So this is where the property seeks to transfer the property to someone else. They do everything necessary in this regard um, apart from sort of that maybe final transfer. And then if the transfer does fail, the property can still be held on constructive trust for the person who was actually going to buy it. So it's basically just going as far as they can. Maybe the legal interest doesn't uh, transfer for some reason. Maybe it's a technical reason or something like that. But essentially, based on the rule in re rose and that transfer, as long as everything necessary has been done, then the transfer will be allowed to go ahead and a constructive trust is used for this. So common intention constructive trust is probably the main one. It's often used in the context of the family home. And so we have in this situation here, this uh, lady and man. And we'll say in this example that the woman in this situation is the only one who is able to get a mortgage. And so the property will be in her name. Nevertheless, both parties contribute to the purchase price and we'll say that the man also contributes in other ways. For example, he might do certain renovations around the home as well, if it needs tidying up and stuff. Um, and, you know, things like decorating and works like that to improve the cost at uh, the price of the house. So we see that in the situation here where the deed or the title of the property, the legal interest is with the woman. Meanwhile, the man certainly has a beneficial interest because he has contributed to the purchase price and he has also contributed towards these renovations as well. So the question that comes up is what happens when this woman decides to trade up? Now, in that situation, she still has the legal title to the property, but the man is losing out because he has contributed this beneficial interest in the form of the purchase price and also the renovations. So he's potentially losing out in this situation, and that's quite unconscionable conduct. And so the courts are going to be able to step in in this situation. According to Lloyds Bank and Rossett, all that they're looking for in this situation is an agreement prior to the purchase. So this is the idea that maybe the um, two people are going to live together in a problem question that might come up and say, this is going to be the home for our family or something like this. And a demonstrable common intention, which is going to be looking at the circumstances of the case, as Lady Hale said in Stack and Dowden. In this situation, we're obviously going to be looking at that money that was contributed, as well as the renovations. And so in that situation, the man would then be entitled to the um, interest in the property um, and the courts would have to work out how much he actually contributed, how much did the renovations improve the price of the property, those sorts of things to try and get an equitable result from the situation. Finally, we can also talk a little bit about constructive trustees. Someone might actually become a constructive trustee without them really knowing about it. In most of the examples that we've talked about so far, this is a situation where someone is a trustee or they are a solicitor or a company director. And so it's obvious that the fiduciary relationship is there. 
but someone can also become a, uh, a constrictive trustee if someone who is maybe not a trans trustee interferes with the trust property or the workings of the trust to the extent that they can be considered a constructive trustee. In other words, someone, you know, completely random getting involved in the trust and acting like a trustee. If they are, then they can be considered a trustee de centaur, which is trustee of his wrong. Uh, and that in that situation, the uh, constructive trust will arise, even though the person is not a formal trustee, because there is still that fiduciary relationship there. And the case to use for this is Mara and Brown. And there we have constructive trusts. If this comes up as part of an essay question, then one of the things that you might want to think about is whether constructive trusts operate a little bit too harshly. When we looked at the case of Boardman and Phipps a little bit earlier, we saw how the trustees had acted in such a way so as not only to generate profits for themselves, but also profits for the trust as a whole. The fact that the trust benefits so much by being able to then acquire those profits as a result of the constructive trust is probably a little bit unfair and doesn't really give the trustee the proper reward for the investments that they have made. If this comes up as part of a problem question, then the starting place is to actually identify the fiduciary relationship. Once you've done that, you should then be able to identify the unconscionable behaviour. So again, you're looking for a conflict of interest or the making of profits. Perhaps it will be something like taking a bribe. And once you've done that, you're just simply explaining how the constructive trust will operate so that the principal has the money that is rightfully theirs returned to them. Well, thank you very much for tuning into this video. As always, leave questions and comments below. Do subscribe for more videos coming next year. And if you get the chance to give it a like as well, then that is always very much appreciated. Right, as I say, best of luck with exams and all terrible things like that. Um, and I'll see you in the new year. Thanks very much for watching. Bye.